welcome back to Drugs and Behavior with Dr. Gooden. This is Chapter 5, Opioids, Opium, Heroin, and Opioid Pain Medications. Now, our society has a love-hate relationship with opium and a category of similar acting drugs that are collectively known as opioids. They are amazing at dealing with pain, but they are also very addictive. Historically, opioid drugs have been referred to as narcotics from the Greek word for stupor, in that they produce a dreamlike effect on the user and at higher doses induce a state of sleep. In the past, the word narcotic has been used inappropriately to mean any illicit psychoactive drug. Now, there are four categories of opioids. The first category comprises three natural compounds that are directly extracted from opium itself, morphine, codeine, and thebane. All opioid derivatives have their origin in these compounds. The second category comprises derivative compounds that are created by making specific changes in the chemical composition of morphine. Examples are heroin, hydromorphone, and oxymorphone. The third category comprises derivative compounds that are created by making specific changes in the chemical composition of codeine and thebane. Examples are oxycodone and hydrocodone. Note the controlled release form of oxycodone is called oxycontin, as opposed to the regular type, which is called percodan. The fourth category comprises drugs that are not chemically related to any of the natural extracts of opium, but rather are synthesized entirely in the laboratory. As a result, they are often referred to as the synthetic opioids. Examples include methadone, Demerol, Darvacet, Lamb, Tramadol, and buprenorphine. Now, opium and history. The method of harvesting raw opium has not changed much in more than 3,000 years. It still takes place in villages of Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and other countries where the weather is hot and the labor is cheap. It comes from the opium poppy, which is different and, and should be different, uh, differentiated from the red oriental poppy and the yellow California poppy. When the petals of the opium poppy have fallen and the seed capsule of the plant underneath the petals is not yet completely ripe, laborers make small shallow incisions in the capsules, allowing a milky white juice to ooze out during the night. The next day, the substance will have oxidized and hardened with contact with the air. Then they go from plant to plant, collecting the juice onto large poppy leaves. At this point, opium is reddish brown in color and has a consistency of heavy syrup, but later darkens further and forms small gum-like balls. Opium dates back before the early 3rd century BC, particularly in Cyprus, near Greece. Galen a famous Greek physician and surgeon to Roman gladiators recommended opium for practically everything, an early example of overprescribing. There are no records in ancient times that refer to recreational use of opium or any problems of opium dependence. Western Europe was introduced to opium by crusaders that learned it from the Arabs. Paracelsus promoted himself as the foremost medical authority of his day. He created a mixture of opium wine and an assortment of spices called laudanum, which derives from the Latin phrase meaning something to be praised. Thomas Sendenham, considered the father of clinical medicine, introduced a highly popular version of opium drink similar that, to that of Paracelsus called Sendenham's laudanum. For 200 years, the acceptable means of taking opium among Europeans and Americans was in the form of a drink. Opium became a recreational drug in Europe and the United States. Now, I should mention the Opium War. In the 18th century, China invented a way to smoke opium which became synonymous in the Western mind with China itself. Prior to this, 
The Chinese had used opium only for medicinal purposes as a highly effective painkiller and treatment for diarrhea. The picture changed when the British discovered and fell in love with Chinese tea and sought to pur purchase and transport it home. They originally had nothing to give China in exchange, but after conquering the Bengal province in India, they had a monopoly on raw opium. So, opium soon flooded into China, smuggled by local British and Portuguese merchants, which enabled the British government and its official trade representative, the East India Company, to maintain a public image of not being directly involved in the opium trade. Opium smoking and opium dependence had become a major social problem despite negative edicts by the Chinese emperor. Tensions arose between the Chinese and the British, leading to a Chinese emperor confiscating and burning a shipment of opium, leading to open fighting and the Opium War. Superior weaponry of the British led to a humiliating treaty signed by China and the acquisition of Hong Kong by the British along with trading rights in major Chinese ports and large amounts of fiscal reimbursement for the war. Note that Hong Kong's ownership by Britain ended in 1997. Fighting broke out again in 1858 and again in 1860 with British forces joined by the French and the Americans leading to a treaty where China was required to legalize opium within its borders. It also opened up China to the rest of the world to some extent. So social perception of opium use was different in China than in Britain. In China, smoking was the way to use opium and opium dens were considered to be very negative and for the lowest fringes of society. British families had respectable parlors where opium could be imbibed or drank. British opium was unlimited and cheaper than gin or beer. Nearly all infants and young children in Britain during this period were given opium, often from the day they were born, to aid in teething pain or colic, or merely to keep the children quiet, which was particularly attractive during the industrial age lifestyle of female workers who had to leave their infants in the care of elderly women or young children when they went off to work in the factories. Opium was fashionable and was made even more so by Thomas de Quincey with his book Confessions of an English Opium Eater, emphasizing the creativity and imagination that resulted from using opium in writing. Until 1942, opium poppies were cultivated in Vermont and New Hampshire, in Florida and Louisiana, and later in California and Arizona. Women outnumbered men in opium use by as much as three to one in the 19th century. Opium was highly marketed alongside alcohol, and opium dependence was frequently replaced by cocaine abuse and vice versa. So now to this slide. Morphine and the advent of heroin. In 1803, the German drug clerk Friedrich Wilhelm Adam Sertener. You don't need to remember that name because... I'm not going to. He isolated the yellowish-white substance and raw opium that turned out to be its primary active ingredient. He called it morphine in honor of Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams. Not in honor of the character in the movie that we all love called The Matrix. That's a different Morpheus. Three-fourths of the total weight of opium, containing inactive resins, oils, and sugars, could be separated out and discarded. Morphine was ten times as strong as opium. Besides morphine, other major opiate products were codeine and thebane, both of which were found to have a considerably weaker opiate effect. With the invention of the hypodermic syringe in 1856, morphine could be injected into the bloodstream rather than administered orally, bypassing the GI tract and speeding the delivery of the effects. Many soldiers became addicted to opiates and opiate dependence was often called the soldier's disease after the Civil War. With increasing worry about opiate dependence, 
A new pain-killing morphine derivative called heroin was introduced into the market in 1898 by the Bayer Company in Germany. It was three times stronger than morphine and believed to be free of morphine's dependence-producing properties. Heroin comes from the word from the German language meaning powerful and was hailed as an entirely safe cough suppressant and as a medication to relieve the chest discomfort associated with pneumonia and tuberculosis. Despite many medical studies, it wasn't until 1910 that the dependency potential of heroin was realized. Heroin is more potent than morphine because it is more fat soluble and can be more rapidly absorbed into the brain across that blood brain barrier. By 1900, there were a quarter of a million opioid dependent people in the U.S., if not one million. That is about 40 times the current rate of usage dependency. The societal movement began to institute government regulation. The Harrison Act of 1914 changed society's perceptions to view the opioid user as weak, degenerate, and self-indulgent, a contaminant infecting his community's social order and, as a result, deserving society's moral outrage in whatever legal sanction it could devise. However, the legislation did not actually ban opioids, but required doctors to register with the IRS all opioid drugs they prescribed and pay a small fee for the right to prescribe such drugs. Later Supreme Court rulings interpreted the Harrison Act more broadly, deciding that no physician was to be permitted to prescribe opioids for non-medical use. Drug dealing of opioids replaced abuse of prescription opioid, opiates. Heroin became the perfect black market drug. It was easier and more profitable to refine it from raw opium overseas and have it shipped to the states in its odorless heroin powder. But heroin's price skyrocketed by 30 to 50 times its original cost. The clientele for heroin changed from the everyday man or woman in all parts of the country to urban adult males whose drug supply was controlled by sophisticated crime organizations. Three major social developments came in the 1960s. A crackdown in 1961 left a shortage of heroin on the street. Good, right? Prices increased dramatically and affected those who were dependent, especially among African American and Latino communities in major U.S. cities. The hippie culture in the late 1960s affected the white majority more directly with hippies, flower children, and the sexually liberated where experimentation with derivatives of the opium poppy and heroin were popular. American armed forces in Vietnam were exposed to opportunities and increased recreational abuse of heroin along with alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs. Vietnamese heroin was 90 to 98 percent pure compared to 2 to 10 percent pure in the United States and it was incredibly cheap to buy. It became very popular among United States soldiers. 11% were regular users of heroin and 22% had tried it at least once. So the military instituted mandatory urinalysis testing, which was called Operation Golden Flow. No, I'm not kidding. The numbers of heroin abusers returned to normal the same as those entering the military as veterans returning home. Perhaps the environmental cues of Vietnam disappearing helped veterans stop using heroin. And perhaps a stressful environment of Vietnam increased the use of heroin. You all recognize this guy? Um, an amazing actor, sadly recently deceased. Turkey was once the main source of white powder heroin smuggled into the U.S. It was grown in Turkey and manufactured and distributed from Marseille in southern France. When Turkish distribution was stopped, other distribu distributors arrived. 
the Golden Triangle region of Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand were the principal providers of heroin to the United States. Purity increased from 5% to over 18%. A relatively pure and an expensive form of Mexican heroin called black tar appeared in 1985. Other forms were created in illegal drug laboratories within the United States, such as fentanyl, a prescription narcotic drug. Chemical modifications of fentanyl allowed it to be 10 to 1,000 times stronger than heroin and were sold under the name China White. The risk of overdose deaths increased dramatically. Fentanyl derivatives and other designer drugs were illegal as a result of loopholes and drug laws. Much as spice was recently illegal for a short period of time when marijuana was not. Let me correct myself there. Fentanyl derivatives and other designer drugs were originally legal, not illegal. And that was a result of loopholes around drug laws. Okay, And this is similar to the, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the uh, chemical um, called spice, which um, was a lot like marijuana, but it did not meet the specific criteria for marijuana and so it was legal until laws were changed to make it criminal. The Controlled Substance Analog Act closed the loophole supposedly by stating that a drug with a chemical structure of pharmacological effects similar to that of a controlled substance is as illegal as the genuine article. In the mid-1990s, Colombia and South America became the dominant source of white powder heroin in the United States. Street heroin from South American sources was cheaper and pure, exceeding 60%, at least 10 times more powerful than the typical street heroin in the 70s. In 1994, a 90% pure brand of heroin circulated in New York City and led to a rash of overdose deaths resulting in a decrease in heroin prices. Note that as media and political attention toward drugs continues to play a role as cocaine and crack abuse began to ebb, the spotlight turned towards the allure of heroin in movies such as Pulp Fiction, in train spotting, in fashion photography such as Calvin Klein fragrance, fragrance advertisements dubbed heroin chic. Due to increased purity and potential potency of heroin in the 90s, the drug no longer needed to be injected but could be snorted or smoked, sometimes along with crack cocaine. HIV infections and hepatitis infections fell, and those who had previously stayed away from the drug due to aversion to needles began experimenting. One to two percent of all high school seniors reported trying heroin usually smoking it. Heroin smoking was more common among younger people as a generation and was more common in suburban communities, particularly in the Northeast. 94% of the world's supply of heroin today originates from the opium crop in Afghanistan, but little comes to the U.S. Instead, the U.S. is supplied by Colombia and Mexico, Mexico being second only to Afghanistan in opium cultivation. With regard to effects on the body and mind, the intensity of the response to heroin changes as a function of the quantity and purity of the heroin taken, the route through which heroin is administered, the interval since the previous dose of heroin, and the degree of tolerance of the user to heroin itself. Additionally, psychological factors related to setting, circumstances, and expectations of the user that make an important difference in what an individual feels after taking heroin should also be considered. Intravenous heroin injection results in an immediate tingling sensation and sudden feeling of warmth in the lower abdomen, resembling a sexual orgasm for the first minute or two. There is a feeling of intense euphoria commonly described as a rash or a flash 
followed later by state by a state of tranquil drowsiness referred to as on the nod. This drowsy period lasts from three to four hours and sexual arousal is diminished due to decreased levels of testosterone in males. Withdrawal symptoms can begin in about four hours requiring three or four administrations per day. Often the first experience with heroin is considerably unpleasant. Opiates cause nausea and vomiting as reflex centers in the medulla are suddenly stimulated. Some first-time abusers find vomiting so aversive that they never try the drug again, while others consider the discomfort irrelevant because the euphoria is so powerful. Physiologically, a sudden release of histamine in the bloodstream produces an often intense itching over the entire body and a reddening of the eyes. Heroin causes pupillary constriction or pinpoint pupils and reduces the sensitivity of respiratory centers in the medulla to levels of carbon dioxide, resulting in a depression of breathing, which may be a major risk factor for death. Blood pressure is lowered and the immune system is suppressed, as is the GI tract, causing labored defecation and intense constipation. With opioids, we deal with a direct effect, the activation of receptors in the brain that are specifically sensitive to morphine. Narcan is an opioid antagonist with therapeutic benefits in the emergency treatment of opioid overdose patients. The receptors that are morphine sensitive are in the spinal cord and brain where pain signals are known to be processed and in the limbic system of the brain where emotional behaviors are coordinated. These morphine sensitive receptors existed due to naturally produced morphine like molecules in the body known as endogenous opioid peptides. Naltrexone is a long acting form of naloxone which when administered three times per week is useful in the treatment of heroin abuse mainly for highly motivated patients usually doctors nurses and other health professionals who must end their heroin abuse to retain their licenses and former heroin abusers on parole at risk of returning to prison if they suffer a relapse. A once a month slow release form of naltrexone is used for alcohol dependence. Patterns of heroin abuse, um, intravenous injection of heroin is the most common, known as mainlining or shooting. Heroin smoking is popular in the Middle East countries and in Asia, but is new to the United States. Newcomers often snorting or injecting subcutaneously through skin popping. Some experienced users snort or skin pop when they can no longer find veins in good condition. Oral administration of heroin is somewhat worthless due to absorption. Sorry, I'm right here on the third bullet. Tolerance and withdrawal symptoms. Um, tolerance to heroin is different with every person. GI or gastrointestinal effects tend to not stop, but pupillary responses eventually subside with tolerance. Tolerance is seen most in decreased analgesia, euphoria, and respiratory depression. Withdrawal begins 46 hours after the last fix, begins with craving, and intensifies to a peak over the next 36 to 72 hours. The abuser is over the withdrawal in 5 to 10 days. Severity of withdrawal symptoms is a function of the dosage levels of heroin that have been sustained. For example, when dosage levels are less than 10%, Withdrawal symptoms are comparable to a moderate to intense case of the flu. While with severe cases, the withdrawal process can result in a significant loss of weight and body fluids. Withdrawal symptoms are the mirror image of symptoms observed when a person is under the influence of heroin. This illustrates a common theme among drug usage. Why produce something in your, on your own? Why produce something on your own? 
when you're getting it from an external source. So often the body will quit or decrease making the chemicals that are being replaced by the drug that is being taken. Heroin abuse is propelled by a combination of fear and distress associated with the prospect of withdrawal, a genuine craving for the effects, and conditioned learning effect. Even the act of inserting a needle can become pleasurable, as some heroin abusers called needle freaks continue to insert needles into their skin and experience heroin-like effects even when there is no heroin in the syringe. This is obviously a placebo effect. With regard to the lethality of heroin abuse, chronic heroin abuse does not damage organ systems and does not result in malformations, tissue damage, or physical deterioration directly. Inhaling heated heroin vapors or chasing the dragon has been linked to neurological damage, though. Heroin has a relatively small ratio of lethal dose to effective dose, so overdose is easy, especially given the fact that it is unregulated. Heroin abusers risk negative effects from a toxic substance that has been cut with the heroin. Many emergencies arise from a combination of heroin with another drug. Some heroin abusers develop unstable levels of tolerance tied to their environment and may overdose in unfamiliar surroundings. The most dangerous effect of excessive amounts of heroin is the respiratory de depression. Sorry, depression. Other deaths are usually due to a massive release of histamine or to an allergic reaction to some filler in the heroin to which the abuser was hypersensitive. Intravenous injections increase risk of hepatitis or HIV infection with unsterile water used in the mixing of heroin may be contaminated with bacteria. An additional risk of heroin arrived in the 1980s when one of the synthetic forms of heroin was manufactured without the removal of the impurity called MPTP that destroys dopamine sensitive neurons in the substantia nigra of the midbrain. The result, this results in full-blown symptoms of Parkinson's disease, even among youth. The dope addict is known to support his or her habit via criminal activity such as robbery, burglary, shoplifting, while other income comes from victim, victimless crimes such as pimping or prostitution or non-criminal activity, often working in the underground drug industry. Practice of controlled or paste heroin intake is referred to as chipping, and the occasional heroin abuser is known as a chipper. Research of these individuals shows no dependence. A number of more reliable studies have been conducted. One with nearly 600 male heroin abusers showed that 50% had died upon follow-up, usually due to accidental poisoning from heroin adulterants or heroin overdose. Other causes included homicide, suicide, or accident, as well as liver disease, cardiovascular disease, or cancer. So, treatment for heroin dependence is difficult due to the short-term effects of heroin withdrawal and the long-term effects of heroin craving, eliciting a need for a short-term and a long-term solution. Traditionally, detoxification can be ma made less distressing by withdrawing gradually rather than cold turkey, a term inspired by the goose flesh appearance of the abuser's skin during abrupt withdrawal. This process may be helped by transitional drug use of opioid drugs in medical settings such as propoxyphene, or Darvon, Demerol, or Methadone. So one strategy of helping a heroin remitter was to have them participate in a program in which oral administrations of methadone were used to substitute for the injected heroin. This process was called methadone maintenance. Methadone maintenance decreases the criminal aspect and intense feelings of heroin craving while also preventing the heroin high. It works 
better when methadone maintenance is conditional on a clean urinalysis. In other words, they're not doing drugs outside of that. 71% of former heroin abusers who have stayed in the methadone maintenance for one year or more stopped their drug use, reducing the risk of AIDS. It also decreases criminal behavior and increases employment. Decreases criminal behavior and increases employment. Methadone maintenance often turns to other drugs uh, to experience a high. So methadone programs also require a daily dosage. An alternative, LAM, spelled L-A-A-M, has a longer duration. A second alternative is the opioid, opioid buprenorphine, or Subutex, which has a longer duration as well and can be combined with naloxone to prevent or deter abuse. These alternatives can be prescribed by any physician rather than a maintenance center. So this also helps these individuals to avoid stigmatization going to the maintenance center where they can be seen publicly. Therapeutic communities have been developed to help deal with the tremendous social stresses that reinforce a continuation of heroin abuse. Many communities are drug-free residential settings based on the idea that the stages of treatment and recovery should reflect increased levels of personal and social responsibility on the part of the abuser. Counselors, as in most situations with drugs, are former heroin abusers or former abusers of other drugs. Multimodal programs combined detoxification treatment with naltrexone, sorry, naltrexone, psychotherapy, and vocational rehabilitation to focus simultaneously on the mul multitude of needs facing the heroin abuser as they successfully reintegrate into society. There are also 12-step groups for support, such as Narcotics Anonymous. There are medical uses of opioid drugs. There are beneficial effects that these, these drugs can have in a medical setting. Heroin is a Schedule I controlled substance, so it is unavailable for medical use, but other opioid drugs are available as prescription medications for the relief of pain, the treatment of acute diarrhea, and the suppression of coughing. Morphine is used for the treatment of pain, while fentanyl, may be used through a transdermal patch instead of morphine, which is preferred due to less constipation and enhanced quality of life. Due to the effects of opioids on the GI tract, they are helpful with diarrhea and digestive processes by slowing down peristaltic contractions in cases such as dysentery where there is severe pain and diarrhea, an opioid can be life-saving by halting the acute dehydration. The opioid medication Imodium is available over the counter to control the area or the diarrhea, but it cannot cross the blood brain barrier, which is probably why it's available over the counter or OTC. Opioids suppress the cough reflex in the medulla. Codeine is often used as an anti tussive or a cough suppressing drug, although a non opiate drug. Dextromethorphan is also available. Unfortunately, dextromethorphan is used recreationally by young people. Opioid prescription pain medications decrease respiration and slow intestinal movement. Many opioid medications are abused for non-medical purposes. Oxycontin and Vicodin, Percocet and Opana are particularly problematic. Oxycontin can be crushed, swallowed, and inhaled as a powder or injected after diluting the powder into a solution with a similar effect to that of heroin. Small towns and rural areas are especially vulnerable to oxycontin abuse and methamphetamine abuse. In 2007, 20 U.S. states reported that the number of unintentional overdose, overdose deaths exceeded deaths 
to either motor vehicle crashes or suicides. Treatment facility admissions increased threefold from 1998 to 2008. Many regions lack adequate monitoring of pharmacy sales, allowing for multiple prescriptions of OxyContin and similar medications through the practice of doctor shopping. Sometimes pharmacies are also robbed. An FDA mandated warning label now states the drug is as potentially addictive as morphine and chewing, snorting, or injecting it could be lethal. A new formulation of OxyContin called OxyNeo contains an added chemical called Remoxy that makes the tablet into a gummy, less easily abusable substance when crushed or dissolved. Creative abusers, however, learn to microwave the new formulation and sniff the burned remains. Others have turned to the extended release form of another opioid medication, oxymorphone, which has now also been reformulated. Vicodin and Percocet are based on opioids, but combined with acetaminophen and Percocet especially, which makes them more dangerous due to the effect of acetaminophen on liver toxicity and death. Prevalence of non-medical use of opioid pain medications is next. Non-medical use of opioid pain medications has increased dramatically in recent years. Approximately 7.6 million young adults aged 18 to 25 in 2011, with 2.1 million using OxyContin, 5.5 million using Vicodin, and 3.1 million using Percocet. In 2009, prescription pain medications were responsible for approximately 15,000 deaths. I will see you guys in Chapter 6.